we're starting to build up an interesting set of circuits that act as blocks. And if we need to build a functional circuit, we can stack our blocks so that one feeds another one. And we can take small voltages and turn them into large voltages. So for example, I might have my phototransistor block that senses light. And that light might come from a signal that um, I am investigating. So from uh, some kind of cell culture, I'm shining light at it, and it's bouncing back, and I can interpret that light to tell me what those cells are doing. The signal might not be very large, so I can take that signal and I can feed it into an amplifier block. So I take this voltage and stick it over here, and now I have a bigger voltage. Maybe for some reason that voltage is too big and I want to make it smaller, so I would feed that into a voltage divider block. Now that voltage is smaller again. And we're slowly going to build up lots and lots of more interesting circuit blocks. And we never really have to invent any circuits from scratch. We really just have to understand how do each of these blocks work and how can I stack them to get what I need in the end. But there's a concept uh, called impedance that says, while I'm creating a voltage here, if I attach it to the input of the next stage, I might be affecting that voltage because the input to the next one might steal some of the current that we assumed was going this way. So this concept is called impedance. And right now we'll just think about it as uh, what happens to voltages uh, uh, and currents, not versus time. So uh, this will get more complicated as we evaluate things like capacitors and inductors. But we'll just consider what happens with resistors right now. So impedance is defined as what is the change in voltage as we change uh, something's output current. So for instance, uh, I might try to make 2.5 volts from a 5 volt source. So I will build a voltage divider with 1K resistors. It doesn't really matter, well, I'll say it doesn't really matter that I use 1K. As long as they're equal, I know I should get 2.5 volts. Um, how much current is leaving 5 volts? Well, it's 5 volts divided by 2K, so it's 2.5 milliamps of current, leaves the 5 volt source, goes through the first resistor, goes through the second resistor to ground. Now that I have a 2.5 volt source, I might want to attach it to something. So maybe I have a 100 ohm resistor to ground. And I would like to apply 2.5 volts there so that I get 25 milliamps of current through the 100 ohm resistor. I don't know why. Maybe that resistor is really has to, uh, is a heating element and I need to make something hot. Uh, maybe there's a resistor and an LED there and the total sum of the current would be 25 milliamps so I have a nice bright LED. So let's just consider this the load we're trying to power something with 2.5 volts. So I made 2.5 volts with 1K resistors. Why couldn't I just attach this 2.5 volt source to this input? Why wouldn't it keep working? One way to think about it is that in total, I only had 2.5 milliamps to work with to make that 2.5 volts. So if I attach this wire to this wire, this guy, if it had 2.5 volts, would try to draw 25 milliamps. This guy couldn't even supply a total of 25 milliamps. So what would happen, um, all, you know, all of the current or a lot of the current would want to go through the 100 ohm resistor. Of course, current would still go through the 1K resistor. And something you should never really think is that uh, we have this saying, current follows the path of least resistance. Not quite true. Current follows all paths of resistance. It's just that more current goes through the path with less resistance. So when the current splits at this node, and some will go this way and some will go this way, some will continue to go through the 1K resistor. But you could also calculate if this resistor is in parallel with this resistor, it has a new equivalent resistance. When you have two resistors that are not very equal in parallel, the resulting resistance is usually closer to the smaller one. So what happens to this circuit is that the bottom resistor essentially becomes a smaller resistor this voltage then dips according to the voltage divider equation, and what we had at 2.5 volts is now much smaller. Compare that to if we had instead used a 100K resistor, then instead of 25 milliamps, it would be 0.025 milliamps. So if I attached a wire from here to here, well, 
uh, 2.5 milliamps leads to the 5 volt source. Most of it continues to go through ground, and let's see, uh, less like 1% of it, right, goes through this resistor to ground. So that means that this voltage probably dips by 1%. So you probably wouldn't even notice. It would go from 2.5 volts to 2.49 volts, and we would get the current that we needed to make uh, whatever this action has to occur. So the, the rule in general is that we should make sure that when we attach a circuit to the output of another circuit, the current that's going through here uh, is not so much affected that the voltage would dip. So that's what we call low Z feeds high Z. Every circuit that we build has some kind of input um, impedance and some kind of output impedance. And as long as the output impedance of one circuit is less than the input impedance of the next circuit, uh, we can stack the blocks. But if the impedances are similar, or if we have a high impedance and a low impedance here, we know that by attaching these two circuit blocks that on their own would have worked, it will stop working. Uh, so in general, it would be good if it was off by a factor of 10. So we would like uh, this voltage here, V out, also has an equivalent Z out. We would like Z out to be less than Z in of the next block um, by a factor of 10. So that means that if we have a 1K resistor here, uh, it is essentially the output impedance of that circuit. The input impedance of this resistor uh, is whatever its resistance is. So we have a 1K feeding a 100K, that's great. If this was a 1K feeding a 10K, also good. 1K feeding 1K, well, two 1K resistors in parallel make a 500 ohm resistor, and that's going to drastically affect what that voltage is. So whenever you think about attaching circuit blocks from one to the next, you have to think, well, what's the output impedance? Essentially, what's the resistance from that point to ground? And how much current does the next thing use? Typically, we have a big resistor with our phototransistors so that the small amount of current that comes from the phototransistor makes a large voltage. So we need to make sure that the input impedance of the next stage is very, very big, because if this resistor is big, we need this one to be a lot bigger. Op amps are great for this case, especially when the input voltage goes straight to the non-inverting pin, because we know that no current should go into the non any of the inputs of the op amp. So a very common op amp circuit that we'll see all the time is called the buffer. V in goes to the non-inverting side. V out is connected directly to uh, the inverting pin. There are no resistors, and the equation is V out equals V in. Essentially, this circuit does nothing because the V out is the V in. It might as well be a wire, except we know that no current goes into the op amp, so its input impedance is infinity. It has the largest input impedance that we can imagine. And then where does the current that goes to the next part of the circuit, maybe it has to go power an LED, come from. It's not coming from here, it's coming from the power supply that the op amp is plugged into. So the op amp is intelligently copying the voltage from here to here, and any current that needs to go that way, it's taking from the power supply, leaving this guy unaffected. 